So um, it's we're on the hour now, so I think we'll just get get started. And as more people trickle in, that's great. Um, so my name is Kaylee. I work in Aptim. I'm a marketing associate, and I'm going to introduce our host for the day. She's Sophia. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our first Aptim webinar. We hope to run more webinars this year on different topics. Um, we noticed that testing in mobile games was something that, you know, as the industry was growing in the last year during the pandemic, uh, testing is a really interesting topic that we wanted to learn more about. And we have some new users of Aptim who are also in the industry. So we really wanted to learn a little bit more from them about what they do, strategies for testing and so on. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sophie, Sophia. Thank you, Kaylee, for the introduction and welcome anyone, everyone who's joining uh, this, this webinar. So uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Aptim. For those who haven't heard about Aptim before, we are a mobile performance testing platform that allows global teams to improve mobile UX by validating our performance on real devices at every phase of development. And uh, so I wanna welcome these amazing speakers who are joining us today. Uh, we have Melissa Hayden, uh, Quality Engineering Manager from Unity Technologies joining us today. Thanks Melissa for your, your time and for sharing your, your knowledge. We also have Alexander Kowalov, uh, Performance Test Manager at Playdica. Thanks Alexander. And we also have Robson Siebel, QA lead at Infinity Games. Welcome Robson, thanks as well. So uh, I'm very excited about the topics that we're gonna talk today. As Kelly mentioned, we've seen a huge interest in the past months uh, from mobile gaming uh, companies and studios that have been coming to Aptim uh, looking for solutions to help them be more efficient when they're testing gather more information about how their games are performing. So we wanted to um, create this space where we could share with our community and people that might not be uh, involved yet in testing video games and mobile games specifically. What are the things that uh, we can uh, share with you in terms of challenges, uh, learnings, and, and the idea is to uh, be able to get some good insights on how uh, these uh, teams are working on, on mobile game testing and specifically performance. So without further ado, I'm gonna start uh, with our first um, question that basically uh, we'll start with you, Melissa. Can you tell us a bit about your company, uh, your team and what your role is? Sure. Um, so my company is Unity Technologies. It's one of the leading uh, engines that allows people to uh, build uh, games on all kinds of different platforms. Um, I am a quality coach and consultant uh, for uh, part of the company that actually get, does gaming services. So uh, you have the engine which is like, you know, our, our main core product. And then um, I'm in part of the company that, that helps developers uh, extend their product and make it a, a, a whole service platform. So um, things like matchmaking and um, ads and um, online play, I, I uh, am a quality coach for that part of the company. Um, and so my role is helping our teams make the best product for our customers. So we don't just talk about the functional stuff or the, the testing, the day-to-day -day testing. We talk about things like documentation and onboarding and, and uh, performance and how, you know, customers might use the product in interesting and innovative ways. So that is uh, my role uh, at Unity Technologies. That's awesome. Looked like a lot of work <laughs> to do there. Uh, thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, Alex, can you please uh, tell us a bit more about uh, Playdica, your team, and what's your role there? Well, sure. So Playdica, it's a global entertainment company, uh, and it specializes on 
uh, development publication free to play games and uh, since 2010 once it was um, founded by Robert Antecol it's like uh, one of the leaders and pioneer of gaming industry so my role is a performance testing manager and in simple words I'm responsible for non-functional uh, requirements non-functional testing testing of non-functional requirements uh, of the game of the games and uh, in terms of stability reliability responsiveness user experience of the game so myself and my team members we are like trying to find bottlenecks establish a system that uh, allows us to find uh, different bottlenecks in code in like architecture and so on in various parts of the game we prepare um, some like backlog for that then spread among the teams analyzing client and server side and analyzing architecture and find out what can be improved and make that improvements uh, like setting up the laboratories for predictive performance testing and like spreading the performance culture among the teams because it's maybe the very important part of the um, performance testing because one team cannot like make a lot of things each person should be aware of performance and uh, impact uh, or like make some uh, like uh, as much as he can so in um like work on performance testing so one as much as one can so basically good performance is just good performance and once your brilliant feature becomes working uh bad like in terms of performance then you'll um struggle and you'll uh it will decrease your retention and revenue that's why maybe it's not direct uh connection between revenue and performance but if performance is not good that's definitely you'll lose your revenue so that's the aspect that we're uh, all the time monitoring and trying to be proactive in order to not to see it in production but to find it before totally and that is something that we defend a lot and try to promote from Uptim. How can we make performance assessing a whole company-wide practice? So this is not something that should be uh, one person in the team responsible. And if you don't have that person, let's say you don't have a performance engineer in your team, then there's nothing you can do about it, right? So how to be proactive and how to uh, make it part of your testing process making part of the things that you need to check before you release a new feature of your game or before you do a new update that might have an impact in the, in the user experience, right? So I think there's a lot of uh, stories that you can tell us there, uh, Alexander. Uh, and then Robson, can you tell us a bit about uh, Infinity Games? What's, what do you do in your team and you know, what's your role? Uh, yes, so Infinity Games is a, a game developer and publisher based in Portugal, focused on mobile, uh, casual, and puzzle games, um, usually with a minimalist art style and designed to, to be immersive and relaxing. And we have free-to-play and also premium games. Um, we use Unity for, for most of our games, so thank you, Melissa, and all the Unity team for, for the great product. Um, and most of our team uh, is here in Portugal and have some people working remotely in some other countries. But, uh, but it's a very small team. And I, my role is primarily uh, a Unity developer. But since everybody wear many hats at our company, I also uh, became the QA lead. And I also develop all, all of our testing pipeline uh, and that we are using now. Uh, and uh, I, I decided to, to start using App Team uh, together with our testing pipeline to, to improve our performance and our, our uh, bug hunting and everything QA related. That's true. And we are very thankful to have uh, Infinity Games as well as our uh, early uh, clients in the mobile gaming space as well. They've been 
they've been a great partner because with with them we have been able to, to improve our product and really understanding how uh, the different roles inside a team not only a tester but from a developer even someone from marketing how could they uh, get advantage of a tool that provides you with a lot of information on how your game is performing so thanks for the introductions. Let's get to the first uh, really interesting question that we wanted uh, to ask you. And let's start with Melissa, because I know you have a lot of experience in mobile in the last 10 years, at least, that you've been in the space and of course in, in quality and testing in general. Can you share with us uh, what was one of your biggest challenges when it comes to testing a mobile game? And what is something that you've done or you are doing now to overcome it? Yeah, this is a really, because this, this is changes over time, right? So uh, initially when we're looking at, you know, mobile applications, mobile games, anything on mobile, it's that, that fracture of like Android OS and then all of the variety of OSs. And now you have like Google Pixel. So that, that, you know, technology fracturing, like how do I cover everything when it's not just one or two devices anymore? Um, and, and having gone through that as a tester um, was pretty challenging um, over the years and, and automation has made that a lot easier. I think now uh, quality isn't about necessarily getting an app put together because a lot of tools have made that easier. It's actually making the app at a high enough level that the the user wants to engage with it and then you keep them engaged with it. So then, um, you know, you can make a puzzle game, you can make any kind of, uh, you know, interactive game, but then how do you make it interactive enough um, to keep that, keep that user with that game? Because they have such a short attention span. So I, I tend to look at quality as how can we help our uh, developers make more interactive, more engaging games. So that's that's our side of the house um, at Unity. And uh, we do everything we can to work with developers on you know, building um, auxiliary uh, services that they can add to their games, like matchmaking, like uh, online communications, um, you know, in-game chat and voiceover, uh, voiceover IP. So all of these things enhance the gameplay and, and just raises the quality of, you know, something that would have been a simple game now becomes a lot more interactive with your users because, hey, I might be in a puzzle game, but I can chat with another player um, or I can share my score or I can win, you know, a, we do, we have a achievement awards monetization so all of that stuff, you know, you can build into the app without having to go too far outside of the Unity ecosystem. And we're always looking to improve those interactions, um, especially now that uh, a lot of um, stores are taking privacy very seriously. So when, when we do that, we take that into consideration because, you know, if you can't get your game on a store because of some policy, like then, then how do we help our developers and makers uh, make sure their games are compliant with uh, new regulations. Um, GDPR is a big example of that too. So, so uh, the quality spans not only the functionality but everything that encompasses that and, and the gameplay. So that's what that's what Unity really focuses on is is trying to help uh, our developers make sure they're making a quality product that their customers are going to love. Totally. Uh, and I've heard a lot of people saying that engagement is key and then it comes monetization in, in games. So how to focus on, uh, and you mentioned that, keeping the player engaged with the, the game, the actual experience that it's, there's a higher bar now than maybe many years ago because devices are more powerful because technology has advanced. And I think along that quality becomes also a center aspect of being able to provide that uh, high quality experience to to the end users so they actually keep not only coming back but also they keep engaged with the product and it actually makes it more complex as well because you are integrated sometimes with you know third-party services uh, and that might 
be part of that quality strategy. Um, Alexander, can you tell us a bit, uh, at least one <laughs> uh, of the biggest challenges that you face inside Platica when it comes to mobile uh, game performance and what have you done uh, to overcome it? For sure. So like the biggest one, I suppose it's once you need to make a capacity testing or capacity planning on a huge setup. Once you have more than one data center, like hundreds of virtual machines, uh, like a lot of uh, Kubernetes setups and so on, data warehouses, databases, and hundreds of thousands or millions of users. And then once you like awaiting um, new feature or it's a marketing campaign and you're waiting increase of users traffic, that's a headache really. And um, there is no like silver or any like precious metal bullet for resolve that question. So it's always compromises, trade-offs. So you need to, for one, uh, like hand, you need to create an environment as much closer to production or at least test in production if you are uh, more or less okay with that. Uh, the more, the closer to production, the more expensive, the more like uh, cheaper, then you won't get realistic numbers and you can't uh, like somehow approximate that results and understand what exactly you need and how much to scale. Uh, that's why it's always um, kind of isolating some um, uh, some flows, understanding what will be the most uh, important, the, where will be the bottleneck. And uh, yeah, it's sometimes it's reusing of auto tests and writing some kind of bots in order to make a load, to put a load. Then for other side, not everything can be scaled uh, easily, just adding additional servers like databases and so on. And you need to understand how it's better to, um, to create the architecture and so on to uh, spread the load among the servers. Um, also writing performance tests, it costs a lot and uh, you maybe need to reuse existing automation tests. It also will save you time in such uh, cases, because almost uh, every time you have automation uh, already created for your functionality, why not to add some markers, some uh, uh, measurements, and it will help you to also understand what's going on, where you are. And of course, uh, solutions which can out of scale like yeah, Kubernetes and you just need to add additional power, like additional hardware, and then you'll easily scale. Yeah, that definitely help, but it can't protect you from the bad code and uh, bad configuration. And it also should be put a lot of effort and attention on configuration testing, not to like uh, to saturate earlier than it's expected due to uh, some numbers somewhere in config. That's why it's a um, hard step-by-step -step analytical work. And yeah, it's uh, the biggest challenge. And unfortunately there is no um, easy solution how to deal with that. Yeah, but a lot of best practices can help uh, to avoid uh, like long hours spending on that. Totally, and and one follow up question for you, Alexander, is how how do you see uh, the differences, or even how often do you do like a whole you know end to end low test of let's say certain game that you actually have to invest in the you know scripting, uh, the actual infrastructure to run the 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 loads of the virtual users. Uh, versus maybe just checking things on every release uh, because I guess it's so expensive to do it to do a end-to-end -end load test every 
every time you release a new version of a sure. game. For sure, that should be kind of impact analysis and uh, like uh, technical guys should understand uh, how much um, like um, where is the most um, and how deep the bottleneck will be in which part of the uh, game after the new feature release and so on. So at first time, at the, at the very beginning, it should be like kind of impact analysis before running all the scope uh, of the tests. And um, um, yeah, um, the best thing is to use to reuse that you already have like the automation you already have for functionality it will definitely um, reduce the uh, cost of this such a testing so guys from JetBrains uh, uses uh, such an approach on uh, project um, rider it's uh, one of the um, uh id and they have millions 20 millions um uh, lines of code and 100,000 tests and they reused uh, a lot of that test for automation testing so i think that the the most um cheapest cheaper uh approach to like have uh, like some kind of performance testing okay thanks for that recommendation yeah. um robson can you tell us uh, you mentioned you you took the role of qa inside infinity games <laughs> uh maybe share with us one of the biggest challenges that you faced in the past mm -hmm. uh, months that you were in, in the role and something that you have done to overcome this challenge yeah, I, I thought it would be interesting to 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 say here how how we came to what led us to Epstein because we, as I said before, our games are designed to be immersive and relaxing, and there's nothing worse to that than a user finding a bug like <laughs> ruin their experience, and 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 after that he'll give you a bad review. So so there's a direct uh, uh, financial implication to to that in the end, and. Um, some of our games have a really big install base, and that that's really important. Not to it's important to avoid as uh, as often as you can having a, a bug go to production. And since we are a small company, we don't have dedicated tester. We don't have a full time tester. And what we do is uh, the people in the team will will help out that to test if it's uh, uh, an update or if it's a, a full game release. We will send builds to everyone with a checklist. But the problem with that was that most of the time the information you got was not precise enough. The bug reports were either vague or they were sometimes incorrect. And that would lead to a lot of uh, wasted time from the developer trying to hunt a bug, trying to reproduce a bug. And, and some of the people that would test um, are not uh, used to dealing with uh, Android Studio or something like that to get uh, logs from the devices. Um, so being able to have a tool uh, that recorded the play session of the person and got automatically all of the logs uh, and generated a, a report, a performance report in the end, is something that for us as a small company was, was pretty huge and, and improved a lot um, the quality of the games because a lot of the, of the crashes or exceptions that we we didn't catch before now we have access so so yeah that's great uh as i said i think we, we help each other uh was mutually <laughs> helping uh helpful to to have both our team uh, incorporated in in infinity games and how we saw that it could get ad adopted by by anyone in the team um so let's move to the next question uh, that we have read, prepared for today uh, and let's start with you, Melissa, again. Uh, is, do you have any recommendations, any best practices based on your experience uh, for uh, reducing testing as a bottleneck? And this is also because 
uh, not only the mobile gaming space, but in general, testing is one of the main bottlenecks that teams mention when they are talking about adopting DevOps, you know, and being more agile in terms of uh, releasing faster. So tell us a bit about, you know, your experience and any recommendations that you can give today to, to the audience on things that have worked for you. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm a pretty big advocate of uh, modern testing principles, which give a lot of uh, credence and leverage to the teams themselves. So developers know the code the best. The more they interact with the code and the more they understand the code, the more they can test it. Um, and they can test it at a level that oftentimes, you know, someone who was traditionally in the role of a tester might not be able to get to. Now there's a collaborative part of that in, in helping the developers understand where the knowledge gaps are. So that's where I come in. I'm still, you know, in that space as someone who can say, hey, you're you've developed this wonderful piece of functionality, but did you think about how to scale it? And they're and they're like, oh, well, okay. And so let's talk about how to test and scale and and then they can usually come up with the solution and I just get out of their way. It's, it's uh, removing myself has been the biggest, uh, you know, reducing that bottleneck, putting automation in place, letting the developers really collaborate on those ideas and, and you know, moving the, the, the production cycles and everything faster because, um, you know, I, I am, I'm not stationed on a team, I'm not embedded, but I'm, I'm there as, as somebody that can coach them and help them, um, you know, or check in and say, hey, did you, did you follow up on this? Um, you know, and this could be anything from, you know, the functional unit testing and, and talking about that to, you know, how do we scale? What kind of documentation should be in place? What, you know, where, you know, should, should the dependencies be noted? Uh, so, so it's a lot of it's a lot of moving pieces, and I, you know, developers are really well positioned to handle that. It's just sometimes we all have blind spots, right? So I'm, I'm not perfect. They're not perfect. But I, but getting out of the collective folks' way that deal with the the code on a day to day basis has really uh, improved, like removing that that bottleneck um, from the development process, along with adding in DevOps and, uh, you know, CI, CD practices, which have just, you know, made things a lot easier. Automation always makes things easier as much as it makes it harder, but you have to balance like the, the positive with the negative, right? So, um, yeah, I, I have a lot of fun uh, just working with developers and coming up with ideas and when they get stuck on problems that are are, are around like quality issues or you know testing or whatever um and and it's it's amazing to have that collaborative space and and to be able to trust the developers to do the right thing because they are they already know what they should be doing so it's really easy to be like hey here's an idea and then watch them create from that idea and do it a lot faster than I would be able to um, by myself for an entire product, right? Because they they have the, the product, like, you know, there's four or five, six people working on it. They have a, a good division of labor at that point that I couldn't ever possibly hope to cover. So as one person on a team that, that does quality. So um, yeah, that that's, that's pretty much uh, how I've I've dealt with it probably the last five years or so is, is to just be that person that, that's cheering the devs on and knowing that they're going to do a great job. And, you know, and if there is a slip up, then we all work on fixing it together and, and moving forward. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. I love what she just mentioned, the role of uh, being more uh, as a coach in terms of QA and helping them in those and filling those gaps that they might not see because also sometimes developers they're always focused on one thing and you know developing a new features and and also getting involved earlier right when you're designing something new what could be the problems here in terms of scalability performance so i think uh, that that's when qa actually takes a role since day zero <laughs> until after you launch and you keep adding new uh, features and and be more like coach or consultant then it's just uh, everything needs to pass through you in order to go to production right which is i guess 
the the way things were done more in the in the waterfall approach. Um, thanks for sharing that with us, Melissa. Uh, your experience in the last five years, um, Alexander. What about uh, you know some bottlenecks that you've seen in terms of testing in Platica and how? Uh, you know, have you fixed them? If they're still there, how are you working on them today? Can you share us a bit about your experience? Yep. So, like, uh, maybe it will be some like caps uh, aspects, but still. Uh, so, uh, I've heard that in a better world, uh, there is no tester somewhere, and only developers do. Uh, stuff and uh, do testing and so on, collaborate with each other, and everything is okay. And uh, uh, maybe the good example is for Codeborn company. I've heard that they uh, use extreme programming, they uh, use pair programming and uh, deliver fast, deliver very like small increment every time. So it means they can deliver. Uh, like every minute, every second, and so on. Uh, of course, um, you like in the middle, maybe somewhere of this continuum, and you decide which uh, practice is better. And if you like agreed and find out that practice uh, good, how you can check that if we are all agile, we can like uh, check somewhere in the lab and then. Uh, establish this practice for all of the units. The only idea that every person should uh, apply and be uh, like agreed with that and uh, do all the stuff and um, no local optimizations, they do not work, only full transformation and every person should understand what exactly is and how to do that. Uh, because sometimes we call uh, something agile, but it's like just a waterfall <laughs> on some agile principles, so on. So first need to assess your processes. It's this bottleneck uh, about processes, about uh, development cycle and so on. So if tester found something in the very end, that means something wrong in the very middle, once it was a code review, once it was uh, code writing and so on, that's like the, the evidence. That's why assess the process, understand bottlenecks, like find out where are they in processes in architecture or whatever, try to fix and all the members of that process should understand that uh, we go in there and this is the only way how to be to become like, you know, more agile to become uh, to avoid such a bottleneck to decrease the testing and so on. So I suppose only uh, in like development culture and testing culture, it could be like resolved, decrease the bottleneck. Of course, uh, something should check. Maybe it will be uh, your pair if it's a pair programming. So it's your colleague who also look at the monitor at the display and see the problems in the code. Maybe it's a, it's a, like a kind of test uh, which check that all things go smoothly and so on. So it depends uh, what will be the most efficient for your setup. For uh, It's not a good idea to try to uh, establish framework first like, okay, we will go into less framework or into safe, and then we'll be okay. No, first find out the uh, small uh, aims you like will uh, go and clearly understandable. So we need to reduce effort on testing before release. Now with one day, we'd like to have a half of day right? and then try to find out the processes which allows you to do that so basically so it's like uh, step by step totally uh, and having a process in place that you can also test and see if it works or not it, it's very important 
And and Alexander, how do you balance uh, inside uh, your team at Playdica or in general the amount of uh, time or when do you do manual testing? Would you do automation? Is it both? It depends on the game, depends on the team. They decide that. Uh, depends on effort. And uh, once it become um, a habit and uh, once it become, um, so it's easier to like, uh, to, to give that knowledge to the manual QA and then you will become an automation guy and like make uh, that uh, and like uh, write automation tests and so on. So it depends on particular case, what is better to do to test manually or to test automatically. Sometimes, yeah, you should spend a lot of time to automate and uh, in order, in, in comparison, you can like easily uh, make manual tests. Um, so the <laughs> the truth somewhere somewhere in in the middle, yeah, like the truth is out there. Um, such a, a tools like an app team for performance for client performance testing uh, allows uh, easily uh, check what's wrong with particular game version with particular build and find out the problems and just not, not just manual QA, but just person from the street can take it and just understand what's going on with the, this particular application. So of course, it's a question of tooling and the question of uh, maturity of the team. Like if we all, like in Agile, there is no names or titles, like I'm a developer and I'm a tester. We're all developers, we're all the testers and so on, developers and test. That if we will go into that better world, then this question maybe is not relevant. Totally, so it, totally. It, yeah, it shouldn't it, be one or the other. It's actually both. <laughs> yep, yep, definitely. That's correct. Thanks, uh, Alex, for sharing with us uh, how you see things and how, how you're tackling uh, these bottlenecks inside Playdica. And Robson, um, can you tell us a bit if you have faced uh, also in the past uh, any bottlenecks where you were testing your uh, games and what recommendations you have in order to uh, overcome them? Uh, yeah, you, you can always ask the developer to stop creating bugs. That works very well. I can attest as a developer. <laughs> yes, but uh, kidding aside, uh, I think having, a, for us at least, having a a good defined uh, test pipeline in a, in a reliable software that can automate some of the steps goes really a long way. And uh, even for, for a developer, because a lot of developers are used to uh, to just checking their, their debug logs. Uh, uh, and then after you upload a build, they like they tested the bug build, but sometimes they don't, they don't do the same kind of testing for, for, for the release. And using that tool like a team for that can also uh, help catching some some annoying bugs, and like release um, uh, reducing the friction between the the on our case since I said uh, our testers are not dedicated testers, uh, uh, reducing the friction between the tester and the developer because sometimes it get a lot of back and forth like like today I had an issue where someone reported a bug like, hey, uh, this is happening at the end of level six. And I checked the video from, from App Team because he was using for that session and it was actually at level 10. So he, so, so if I didn't have uh, the video to, to back it up, uh, I might have lost quite a lot of time like chasing a bug that didn't really exist. And, um, and uh, also uh, software being easy to use for us, it was, it was, uh, huge um, to have someone that's not uh, uh, used to to complex tools being able with a few clicks to install a software and all its dependencies uh, and and be able to test uh, without much hassle uh, that that helps a lot and improve the our, our testing pipeline. 
That's great. Uh, thanks for sharing, uh, Robson. I do have a question. Um, actually, it, this came from the audience, and we're going to go now. We are on time for questions from the audience. <laughs> that I, I, I was. It's, it's it's a it's a very good question, and I'm going to ask it. Anyone can take the lead on answering first. And they are asking what are the main differences between uh, testing a regular mobile app and testing a mobile game. Who's, uh, who wants to answer that first? Maybe there are no differences, so any answer is valid. Well, there are some, there are some, I think setup is a little bit more, plus there's a complexity of logic. Sometimes uh, mobile apps tend to be a lot more static uh, and use um, some web interface, whereas mobile games can have both. So you can end up, you know, be in a mobile game that's, uh, and then like the ad would be in a web, Part of the app and then you have to come back and then so there's there's a lot more complexity i think involved in in the setup and testing of a mobile game um than it than a mobile app having done both like uh you know mobile apps are are you know complex as it is but you know you have multiple platforms you're looking at but then you multiply that by the game complexity and the algorithms and the performance you have to maintain um, and then the, the handoffs between like, you know, ads or online chatting or any, any other auxiliary things that your app's doing besides just being a game. So, um, there, yeah, the, I would say it's because of the complexity and how complex that, that, um, gaming ecosystem is and how, how the games are built, then you, you have a lot because there's performance at different levels because you have, you know, the game performance, you have device performance, you have network performance. Um, and so, and, and I don't think uh, a regular application, except for maybe in finance, because you're dealing with more encryption and stuff like that, do you have like that kind of complexity? So uh, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a lot in a mobile There's game. a lot of levels that you need to take into consideration. And also yeah. we've been talking a lot with, uh, um, developers and testers of mobile games and they say that also specifically with mobile games ad testing so the ads that you need to add to add mm -hmm. to your game usually that's a form of monetization they they involve a new layer of tests that you need to do specifically to see how that you know sdk yeah. might impact the the performance of your game and it's not something that is specifically related to uh the the, the development that you already did right so there's at least four different layers that you need to take care of. So of course it, it makes it more complex than maybe a, a transaction, a mobile app or some type of uh, more regular app that we are all used to. Yeah, for sure. And especially with the, the ads complexity because um, you can get a, a full page static ad, you can get a banner ad, you can, I mean, the size and the shape of it. And now there's like video ads and interactive like it literally switches you to another game. So then you have to handle that game logic and then come back. So there is there, the, the complexity of the ads have added like more complexity. So uh, yeah, so, so there's a lot, there's a lot there to dig into um, at a lot of different levels. Totally. Uh, Alex, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's uh, when we started testing uh, game applications. It's uh, much more aspects. Like we, once we are just talking about just regular web application and client server model. So there is no usually problems with clients. So it's desktop, you have a like a browser, this is it, and server somewhere. But once you are talking about games, it's like three different universes. It's a client uh device and uh, server and network uh, in like in, in the middle of them and inside the server for instance it, it's several that data centers and so on so yeah a lot of a lot of things appears so if you have native some kind of like i don't know troubles and you need to uh, test on different uh, uh like uh, processors models types and so on, so it's become kind of mess. A lot, a lot of efforts because of uh, matrix of that dependencies and so on. 
Totally. Yep. And uh, Robson, I know your experience has been in mobile gaming for a long time. So yeah. maybe, uh, I don't know if you can compare with another type of mobile app that maybe you have experience in the past, but is there anything that you want to add uh, in terms of uh, yeah. the difference between? I think it's much uh, with apps. I did work a little bit very brief, briefly with apps, but uh, I think it, they are more, uh, much more linear usually. So you can predict uh, user behavior uh, much easier on an app. And depending on the game you have, like if you have an open world, open world game, you don't know what the user is going to do first. So that opens uh, a, a, a huge spread of possibilities that depending on the order that he, he does something, then you, you might run into a different bug. And also input methods, even on, on phones, like with an app, you only have the touch screen, but uh, if you have a game, you might want to support a controller. And that's a whole nother layer of, of, of possible bugs. Totally. Yeah, I think that the just to summarize it, summarize it in one word, it would be complexity uh, at different levels and, and how you understand how they interact. And that, of course, uh, changes your approach to the types of tests that you might do on a mobile game versus um, transactional app. Uh, so I, I think it, it's clear that it's, it's not the same. Um, I have another question related to non-functional aspects of, uh, of a mobile game. So in your experience, what, what's more difficult to, to measure? Uh, you mentioned, we, we talk about like device performance on the client side, we talk about network, we talk about load testing the, the servers. Um, what, what are the things that you had uh, experienced in the past in terms of what's more difficult to measure, what's more critical for the business to work properly, where do you focus first when you maybe think about um, performance? I think Alex talked about one of the biggest challenges that is doing an end-to-end -end load test. Uh, but when it comes to client side or when it comes to the network, what are the things that uh, in your experience uh, are difficult to measure and what do you uh, care the most also when you need to prioritize? I suppose as we talk about fresh player, for sure, he or she should see the functionality of your game as much as soon as possible. That's why like entering the game fast, it's like, the I don't know, should be the most prioritized because uh, if you, if it's take a really long time, but, but again, it depends on how um mm, uh maybe um, how, how user uh wait during or, or, or what experience he has during the waiting if it's in something interesting and he like interact with something even during the game during the waiting like lobby or whatever uh inside the game it's maybe a, a good thing then it's just blank page and like some spinner which uh, like make him crazy and so on so of course for fresh users i suppose you to get to the lobby as fast as possible is a critical thing but then other features should work also fine and you should not spend uh, much time on other like opening i don't know store or whatever so uh the, the time that it takes for them to start interacting with the game the first time would be one of the main areas of focus and improvement uh and then in, in your experience also uh, alex what have been some common uh, issues that you've seen or you have to solve in terms of uh, game performance? Is it transitions between one level to the other? Is it interaction with ads, if you have any ads in the game? Is it, it, it really depends. Maybe there's no uh, common pattern. You mean what affect uh, the loading Co time? Common issues, yeah, common issues that, or things that you care, you take care of, of the most, meaning things that need to be, uh, you know, for example, you mentioned the load time, maybe, you know, it should be three seconds or less, or is there an, any other part of the 
the game that you focus in terms of non-functionality aspect that they need to work and you are checking that frequently? Um, it depends on the game and depends on the audience of the game. But uh, like the things that can affect loading time may come from like server code, from bad network, from client code. It's like can be everywhere. And that's the point to put attention how it how the game will work on uh, in case of uh, network throttling, in case of device is not uh, performance good. I mean, like old one or uh, something like that had not enough resources and game should be like, uh, should have some adaptation to that, to the uh, kind of device. If it's uh, like uh, good perform, well performed or not. Uh, but again, from audience, it depends if it 45 seconds is okay or not. If you see uh, like a uh, bank transaction in the, mm, I don't know, ATM machine, and maybe 45 seconds is okay. If you see that your transaction for transferring money will spend like half a second, that will make you like to think about if it's okay or not. But if you see like uh, 45 or I don't know, 20 seconds, it's okay. But in the game, again, it depends. If it's like shooter and you need to uh, to be very responsive, no way to spend more than, I don't know, three seconds to wait sometimes to, to go into the game. But if it's like some game which uh, not need such a, um, frequent reaction from the uh, audience, from the from the user, then it's okay maybe in some cases to show some um, interesting stuff which user can spend time looking at or interacting with until the main uh, feature and the main thing will appear. It depends on what kind of game and audience of the game. Totally, uh, I totally agree. And and also when it comes to performance and we get this question a lot, uh, which devices should I test? It really depends on your yeah. audience. <laughs> a lot of questions is it depends. A lot of answers is it depends. And I think the question that we should receive, it's, it's gonna be that answer, but I'm still gonna ask in case you have some extra uh, insights. And, and also in, in this case uh, for you, Alexander, that uh, we know we have different teams testing performance and how you manage this. So the question is, what would you recommend? Um, what would be a recommended approach to create performance benchmarks for mobile games? So uh, from our experience, and I think we even talked with this uh, about this with Melissa recently. Is there any best practice in terms of what should be a good uh, CPU usage, memory usage for a game? Uh, is this something that internally the team should decide based on what their audience is? How do you tackle uh, this area? Um, as for gaming, I suppose it's self-written solutions uh, will be used more often than some, I don't know, tools. But it, it, again, it depends. Uh, because uh, there is no better than inject somewhere a measurement of something of piece of code, of piece of client, piece of server code. But now we are talking about client, so piece of client code, and we like start and stop the measurement, do kind of uh, benchmark and see, okay, how it like, uh, how much time it spent for that, pieces of code. And I suppose um, this is the most accurate um, measurement. Uh, all do, you other... bench, do you benchmark with other games or do you just try to improve it? Or you take the first measurement as a baseline and then you see how over time it, so uh, it you know, responds? It, it can be measured from number of uh, like users and then 
you can understand uh, how this but again so first you need to understand business critical transactions if we talk about classical performance so first of all you need to understand what's make uh, the most effect on your like uh, revenue retention whatever and then step by step you can do benchmarking uh low testing so on the approach could be different use such a tool as a team set markers and see what's wrong with this uh event like with this uh transaction with this feature and the deep dive and then profile using code profiling analyze uh, slow uh, pieces of code refactor re and so on so again it depends if you uh, but the uh, of, co of course self written solutions will be um, the most accurate because you inject something in your code and this code uh, shows the the like the uh, the real uh, duration but again it uh, also take time to do and uh, if you have by hand a good profiler which can easily shows you the uh, bottlenecks the uh, slownesses so it's at first it's uh, better to use uh, to use that Perfect. Um, Melissa and Robson, do you have anything to add to this question? Uh, yeah, like I think it again depends on the game, depends on your audience. Um, asset management is a really good way to um, make sure that you're hitting a benchmark for your memory usage. So I I always you know profiling. Um, how you put together those assets uh, and what you're doing with them. Like, you know, if you have assets that are really high resolution and you're using those in a, you know, rich environment game, how can you optimize how that game's performance is working so you can keep that high level of, of visual, um, but you're not slowing down like the whole device. So I, I think, um, I think it, it just, it, it's a balancing act, right? Like, what what do you what do you what do you take away? What do you keep? What you know to keep that experience high, but also keep the performance high with that experience. Um, and and I, I see game developers making trade offs all the time about like high performance in some areas versus other areas. Um, I know uh, one of them that like we you know we help developers with is is in like um, achievements and awards because ads usually are combined with that aspect of like oh if you watch this ad you get like a prize or you get like an achievement or whatever so if that interaction isn't really fast or it doesn't register correctly people get really upset about that and then they usually blame the game and then the game developer comes and goes hey what happened to your system and then why isn't it performing and it should be under three seconds and they should have their award you know so um so we see a lot of that kind of interaction and we have to balance you know how fast and how fast we can respond to games that scale pretty quickly that are having a high transaction so it's so it's all of that combined that's like a whole other vector of 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 performance stuff that's just an added layer to that game so yeah I have it's to add there so i play a game that's free to play it's back gammon and um i had to watch ads in order to play again or to get enough coins to bet my wager and play again. And it was so slow. I was just like, I'm just gonna buy coins. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that's maybe- also, I mean, that's a strategy some games take is to slow that down too. So- Maybe that's uh, something they're doing on purpose. Like who knows? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we can't, we, we can't control that. I, you know, but we offer a service that lets people add ads to their system so that they can monetize it. Um, I, but yeah, I, I mean, people take all kinds of different strategies with ads, but the, the, um, I, but I do notice that there's a certain thing with, uh, you know, making sure that's performant because we do, we do have to, you know, at least make the game enjoyable enough or at least make it not tedious enough that you just go oh forget this i'm i'm out right and unload the game so that that that's where we try to help developers achieve whatever experience they want with the you know the the ads reward 
achievement model. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So we are just on time. Uh, I just want to thank first the three amazing panelists that we have today, Robson, Melissa and Alexander, uh, for sharing your experience, your insights. And we still have more questions that weren't answered. So we're probably going to follow up with, uh, with them later. And, and also, uh, at Upteam, I mentioned we're a mobile performance testing platform. We are uh, also uh, today um, going after different verticals, not only mobile gaming, but we think mobile gaming has, you know, all this complexity that we talk about has a lot of uh, uh, challenges that we want to help. So if there's any mobile gaming uh, developer or tester in the audience that wants to try Aptim, you can actually sign up for free. And please do send us your feedback because we, we also want to know uh, how your experience is with our tool. And that's all for today. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a great day, uh, rest of your day. And we'll see probably everyone in the next uh, webinar that we do uh, from Uptim. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone who came today as well. Great, thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you all, have a good day. Bye.